thank you very much. I'll now take us through the protocol for the afternoon meeting. And um, just to uh, start us off, uh, we request that you mute yourself. I think we've said this um, more than once since we started. So kindly have your microphone on mute unless you have been requested to, it, to turn it on. Uh, I think this will provide all of us a conducive environment for the conversations that will happen this afternoon. We are also requesting that uh, we be on time and uh, particularly for our speakers, our guests, uh, we request that you be on time so that you can fully participate in the engagement. I think at uh, this we have had a conversation and we are all well versed. Also to check and test our technology. This will be our, our computers, our, our videos, especially for our presenters. We want to make sure that we can get the best uh, of, your, of your session and of your thoughts and remarks. We request that for all of our participants, kindly have your camera off unless you're requested to turn it on. So again, this is just to make sure that we have a, a very conducive environment and we are not distracted by anything that uh, it would be going on uh, in the background of members or attendees for this afternoon. Uh, for all of us that are going to be speaking, kindly have uh, work appropriate clothing. So we it's a formal afternoon webinar and uh, we request that for anyone who may be turning on their video, you, you please have a work appropriate uh, formal, smart, smart formal uh, dressing, which is appropriate. We also request that you frame uh, yourself proper, properly in the camera so that you can uh, really get the best of your audio and video experience for the benefit of the attendees that have joined us this afternoon. And uh, we request for all of our participants kindly engage using the chat box. So you're able to type your comments, your suggestions, your questions on the side bar and we will be having a look at that so that we can really bring in the thoughts and the, the thoughts and the remarks of our audience in the course of this afternoon discussions. And lastly, uh, just again to request uh, no eating during the live event, especially if you may be turning on your microphone. Perhaps you will have your video off, but you and you may think no one is seeing you, but we are actually able to get the noise if you're having um, a meal at your side. And uh, with those remarks, I really welcome us and hope we're going, we're going to have a very engaging, insightful afternoon. And really, let's uh, bring in our participation uh, to the best of our level. And just to start as formally, we want to welcome my colleague, uh, Brenda, to start off the meeting with a word of prayer. Welcome, Brenda. All right, let's pray. Uh, dear Lord, we come before your holy presence this afternoon, thanking you for the wonderful day. Thank you for enabling us to have this webinar today. We thank you for all the participants that have joined us. May, may the agenda of this meeting be decided and con consciously. Let all people concerned contribute wisely to come up with solutions according to your will. Enlighten all of us to speak and interact with you in our minds, dear Lord. And it is in Jesus' name we pray and amen. Uh, thank you, Brenda. At this point, I want to welcome uh, Chief Manager in, stretch, in, in charge of uh, physical planning and development, uh, Architect Anna, to give the opening remarks. Welcome, Architect Anna. Thank you, Josephine. I would like to welcome uh, everybody who has come to this webinar. Today we're going to have an exciting moment as we discuss the role of emerging digital technologies in shaping the future of smart and sustainable cities after the current pandemic, which is COVID-19. Members present, you need to note that Konza Technopolis is actually designed as a smart and sustainable city. And some of the digital technologies we are using in Konza Technopolis will be powerfully be presented by our account, uh, by our CEO at Konza. But just for everybody to note is that the vision of Konza Technopolis as a project is actually to be a leading global technology and innovation hub. We have actually been established to bring forth economy from knowledge base technologies for Kenya, and this is going to take Kenya to first world economy. Not that recently in 2018, Kenya became part of the second world countries 
in economic development. So as a nation, we are looking forward to being part of the nations in the first world, but we cannot wish away issues of technology and innovation, and especially in development of urban cities, just as Konza Technopolis is. So today I'm very excited uh, to welcome our keynote speaker, who is none other than our permanent secretary in the Minister of ICT, Jerome Cheng, CBS. Much welcome, sir. And we are going to have exact, uh, exciting panelists discussing with us this subject, including Mr. Adam Lane, who is the Deputy CEO of Government Affairs at Huawei. We are also going to have Mr. Muga Kibati, who is the CEO of Telcom Kenya. We are going to hear a lot from Christian Joen, who is the head of Geneva UN Charter Center of Excellence on SDG for SDGs in city transmissions. We are far much excited to host um, Bitang and Demo, PhD, who actually, who actually had the brain for Concert Technopolis as a project, and you're going to know if we are really living his dream today. And lastly, and not least, Ms. Susan Mbogo, who is the Public Sector Director, East Africa um, Intel Corporation. So, all protocols observed, I welcome all of you, ladies and gentlemen, to this webinar. And we are going to begin with an introductory presentation on Konza Technopolis from the CEO of Konza Technopolis. Welcome, Engineer John Tanui. Thank you, my colleague, uh, architect Anna Mushimi, and um, also um, our PS, uh, Jiromo Cheng, uh, our panelist uh, led by um, Professor Andemo, Muko Kipati, CEO, Telcom, uh, our friend from uh, Norway, um, Christian, um, and also uh, Ms. Mboko. We, I'll just take a few minutes just to introduce about uh, Konza Technopolis. Our focus as a technopolis is to be a global technology and innovation app, and uh, we will achieve this by developing a sustainable smart city and an innovation ecosystem that we aim to contribute to Kenya's innovation uh, ecosystem. There are two key pillars that we have highlighted or identified as the key uh, foundations to make Consa Technopolis a success. One is the, what, the infrastructure, which uh, my colleague Anna has mentioned, which we are calling Technopolis Infrastructure and Smart City Services. The second one is building the knowledge economy and the innovation ecosystem. So these two are the two foundational things that we need CONSA to take off. And in the next three slides, I'll be telling you briefly where we are on this. Uh, CONSA Technopolis uh, focuses on three strategic uh, crowd clusters. That's the ICT and ITS, IT enabled services and the life sciences. Uh, the other one is engineering, and it will be driven by two uh, key um, areas, that's research, uh, training, and the commercial activities for those enterprises. Some of the achievements we have uh, in respect to the two key pillars I mentioned, uh, we are setting up a research institute at, at Consa Technopolis. The designs are completed, and uh, we are soon um, onboarding a contractor to start the construction of the research institute to be called Kenya Advanced Institute of Science and Technology. And this will be the driver for the technology part of Consa Technopolis. Uh, we have the national data center, which uh, with the Ministry of ICT has been located at Consa. Phase one is ready and um, is going to play also a very critical role. We also have our building ready at Consa Technopolis and the infrastructure is ongoing. Uh, we have set up the needed infrastructure, be it access roads, uh, electricity, connecting concert to the national grid, uh, both for water and electricity and road network and ICT. And this infrastructure will make Concert Technopolis a premium location. One key infrastructure inside Concert Technopolis is what we are calling horizontal infrastructure, 
which uh, works have now started, we are at about 30%. And this involves uh, what we are calling streetscapes, utilities, including utility, utility corridor, a very interesting feature which links to today's uh, discussion about landscape, landscaping and uh, parks, 30% open spaces, also ICT infrastructure and smart city facilities. Now we are going to have really a world-class uh, smart city uh, in terms of actual deployed uh, solutions and a platform for further innovation. This is some of the uh, pictures. It's still a construction site. Uh, this is of the Consa Technopolis. We are getting a lot of materials from the neighboring community within the buffer zone. There is a quarry, there is a borrow uh, pit, and many more outside Consa Technopolis. The next slide is now inside Consa Technopolis. The roads, the piping works, we have so many kinds of uh, infrastructure underground. It's a unique opportunity that you see a city being built from scratch building, putting the water infrastructure, electrical, and an interesting um, utility corridor, about 2.5 meters by 2.5 meters utility corridor, what you can see there. This will provide current services and future uh, services. We have other projects ongoing also, including wastewater treatment, freshwater treatment, solid waste distribution, which is smart. Uh, what you are seeing there is the plan of concert. The green is the uptake, uh, the spaces that have been taken, the 4,400 acres of land represented by about 145 parcels of land, including schools, industrial park, technology, and uh, commercial spaces. The interesting part now is the key as aspect we are discussing today about a smart city. We have set up an infrastructure and a, a, a framework which focuses on the residents, the people as at the center of all this to ensure that we achieve a smart economy. We look at the infrastructure to ensure that the intelligence is inbuilt, including uh, some uh, the solid waste will be one of the first in the region, which is separating the solid from the source and, um, and um, ensuring that it is automated. So we have ensured we have a, a, a framework, a platform that will uh, enable current and future services. So any new emerging solutions can be provided with the platform that we are going to put there. We will have a, a Wi-Fi and also a fiber network. And a number of city services, uh, including touching environment, transportation, uh, logistics, security, and, and so forth. So this is a platform that will be possible to provide all kinds of new emerging solutions for the city uh, in terms of uh, targeting at a better experience for our residents. And additionally, we are going to have what we call an IoT lab, where we can actually experience new solutions. And one key feature you have seen there is what we are calling the poll, a feature which will be actually the, the, the where we'll use uh, several IOTs to connect and uh, operate the city to make life um, a better experience for all our users. That's uh, some of the solutions. The smart parking solution is one of the solutions we are looking at uh, with the spaces and it's part of the current solution we are going to deploy there. So overall, we are going to have world-class infrastructure. We are going to have an IOC that is an intelligent operating center and we are also going to have an IoT lab. So that is in brief the platform that we are putting up in Consa to be the digital platform to drive the smart cities in our region. So that's uh, all I needed to bring for this uh, afternoon. Uh, it's my honor, it's time now to invite our PS, Chiromo Cheng, who is going to give his keynote address uh, to us. PS uh, Karibu. Mm -hmm. Well, <clears throat> Asante Sana, uh, CEO uh, for the great introduction you've given about uh, Konza and uh, let me also just uh, also recognize the presence of uh, Professor Bitangendemo, Associate Professor and Management Consultant who actually was the brainchild and also has played a very big role in the development of uh, the emerging technologies uh, strategy uh, for Kenya. Let me also recognize Mugo Kibati 
CEO Telcom Kenya, who's also been partnering with us and uh, we've worked very closely in terms of ensuring the establishment of various infrastructures. Uh, CEO uh, Konza, engineer John Tanui, we really appreciate the good work that uh, we are doing. Uh, the deputy CEO, Huawei Technologies, Ab Adams Lane, again also we wish to uh, recognize you and also Christian John, the head of UN uh, Charter C Center for Excellence on SDG. Uh, the distinguished guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon. I am pleased to be part of today's discussion hosted by Konza Technologies, focusing on the role of emerging technologies in shaping the future of smart and sustainable cities post COVID-19. Let me say that even before the emergence of COVID-19 pandemic, the world has been grappling with challenges that relate to urbanization and overpopulation, which really has led to the degradation of natural resources and climate change. These developments have also led to interesting synergies being developed in various phases of the society, focusing on solving these key issues. Government across the world have been adopting smart cities concept to ensure sustainable urban development and conservation of natural resources. This webinar, therefore, offers us a great opportunity to consider the emerging digital technologies as well as their ability to solve challenges before us while making our lives better. Again, this is a platform that provides us with the opportunity to compare notes, share key learnings, and also build on whatever uh, we have in our various sphere, spheres of operation. Let me say that really COVID-19 pandemic has accelerated the need to drive the technology agenda. I always say that COVID was and is really one of the greatest advertisers of technology because with the advent of COVID, there has been a lot of interest in technology in a way to try and solve uh, the challenges we encounter. The way we work, study, shop and travel have actually been taken over by technology and it has now become commonplace for us to quickly adopt across all sectors of the economy. Ladies and gentlemen, the Konza Smart City was a vision developed strategically to take advantage of the technical, technological advances our country has made, more specifically with focus on our Vision 2030 agenda. The key objective of the strategy is to develop and manage a world-class smart city that has a vibrant, safe, secure, healthy, and sustainable ecosystem with the technology at its balance. As government, we remain cognizant of the fact that we are keen on working closely with the different partners in order to leverage on the power of technology to improve our lives. As such, we continue to support technology and innovation in different sectors of our economy, not only during this period, but also in, f in the future. It is approximated that 70% of new value created in markets over the next 10 years will be on digitally enabled businesses. Smart cities are, will, are and will be key drivers of innovation, digital business model, and disruptive technology will fast track the digital economy and also accelerate the new value creation. Traditionally, cities have been provided and developed providing services in silos, with each department making investments to address service delivery independent of each other. This has really led to high infrastructure costs, wastage in resources, duplication of resources, and many other problems. We can all agree that in today's world, technology is an essential part of our lives, and as such, we must constantly look at ways through which we can continue to leverage the available technology. The objective, therefore, is to enhance the quality and performance of our urban living spaces in order to reduce energy consumption, manage the cost of service provision, reduce 
greenhouse gas emission and also improve the general well-being of our people. Ladies and gentlemen, the answers to these challenges is the adoption and implementation of smart cities. Smart cities predominantly uses ICTs to develop, deploy, promote sustainable development practices that addresses urbanization challenges. Through technology, smart cities increases operational efficiency, drive economic growth, improve the quality of available services, and also enhances citizens' interaction. I'm happy to report that phase one of the Konza Smart City project is under implementation with several infrastructure going on, like it has been mentioned by the presentation by the CEO, that we could actually see there are a number of things that have already taken place. Key among these have been the construction of the office block and uh, conference facility, the horizontal infrastructure, the National Data Center, the Kenya Advanced Institute of Science and Technology, and the Kenya Electricity Transmission that has put already in place a 400 kV power station and the waste, wastewater reclamation facilities. Uh, let me add by saying I know people have been asking what has been really been going on in Konza, but actually this basic and uh, I mean, uh, primary uh, requirement issues of the horizontal infrastructure has really been what has been taking most of our time. Uh, I remember in another conference telling people like when where I'm sitting right now is the teleposter. When it was being constructed, it almost took a whole year to just get out of the foundation from the foundation and people kept on wondering what is going on down there. So basically that is where we are in any other building whilst you're still establishing foundation. People keep on wondering what has been going on. But then once we hit and get back to the surface, then moving becomes very fast. And I want to guarantee that you will see a lot of movement very soon, bearing in mind that we are almost coming out of our foundation. The ongoing horizontal infrastructure is one of a kind. The development entails the construction of an underground utility tunnel that will host a variety of installations such as the fiber optic, the power cable, water pipe, and also smart sensors. In addition to the unit utility uh, tunnel, the all access roads will be tarmacked with the provision for pe pedestrian ways and deployment of ba bus rapid transport, that is the BRT system. And that is what has really been taking most of our time. Furthermore, I'm pleased to report that phase one of the containerized data center is complete and phase two, which consists of a permanent building that is final stages of completion. I supervised that event uh, a couple of weeks ago, and we are committed that by the end of the year, we'll be having the permanent data center already completed. These data centers will provide the computing power needed to support the smart city technologies optimally, as well as support all ICT dependent application processes, innovations, and technology. And I also want to comment that even the government will be relying on that uh, data center facility for repository and uh, compute uh, power. In addition to technology, the environment is a key development priority at Konza. The authority therefore plans to grow 1 million trees within the next three years as part of its conservation and greening efforts. In addition to the greening effort, Konza Technopolis will provide a wastewater reclamation facility, which will be part of the integrated water management plan, and that aims at reducing the consumption of fresh water, encouraging reuse of treat treated wastewater for non-potable purposes, and maximizing the potential of resource recovery, such as biomethane and biosolids production. Ladies and gentlemen, the evolution of technology has enabled us to conceptualize and actualize smart cities. From people-driven technology of past decades, today we are at the age of the Internet of Things, which has evolved from more commonly known Internet of Things. Whereas the Internet of Things sought to connect devices through networks without human interaction, the Internet of Everything 
seeks to take these interactions further by bringing in the four pillars of people, processes, data, and things together to make the networked connection more relevant and available. Furthermore, edge computing is changing the way data is processed and stored. Due to the interconnectedness of smart cities facilities and with the deployment of smart devices, intelligent systems and application, placing compute and analytic power close to where data is created is making the case for edge computing. As business and government explore how to provide services in post-COVID-19 world, conversations such as this one is necessary as they allow us to exchange ideas on the advances in technology and innovation which will drive the establishment and institutionalization of smart cities. Through the Konza Innovation Ecosystem Initiative, the authority has developed several initiatives to promote dialogue and engagement among stakeholders from the public, private sector, academia, civil society, in order to explore ways of driving the smart city agenda. As part of this mission to support the creation of a vibrant innovation space, we have developed new solutions and enterprises, and Konza organizes hackathons together with boot camps and accelerates the qualifying submissions through the Konza Technology Forum in order to access their commercial viability and market readiness. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, upon completion, the Kenya Advanced Institute of Science and Technology, popularly known as KAIST, a graduate school which will focus on science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, will further promote research and development of new technologies and innovation, which will be imperative in driving the knowledge economy in the technopolis, our country, and even across the region. I have no doubt whatsoever that it will be a welcome addition to our country's vibrant tech ecosystem. In addition, Konza will also host a Sustainable Development Accelerator Lab, which will provide support in the pursuit of accelerating the attainment of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, which was adopted by the UN uh, in 2015, as a blueprint for peace and prosperity for the people and the planet now and in the future. Let me take this opportunity, therefore, to really thank all of you for your participation, and I look forward to future engagements and more engagement in this particular webinar. Thank you very much and all the best. Thank you, uh, BS, uh, BS Jerome Moncheng. Um, you've uh, pointed the direction of our discussion uh, this afternoon. And um, I request those, if you are not presenting, please uh, have your video off, our colleagues, uh, to ensure our focus is on the panelists. I'll now be giving to our moderator, who is uh, Dan Mwanki from the Nation Media Group. He will be taking up uh, from here. And um, we will uh, have the panelists uh, now engage and uh, talk about uh, emerging technologies uh, in smart cities and especially during COVID and post uh, COVID uh, period. Dan Wangi, uh, take from there. Um, thank you very much, Bonasi, you, and thank you very much to all of you for joining in this important conversation. Like he said, my name is Dan Wangi. I am a business news anchor and I'm also an, an innovation yeah. editor at NTV. Um, I would just like to begin by introducing the panel that we have. Uh, we have a very significant and powerful panel, the masses for myself. We have um, Dr. Bitang Demo, who is um, the former principal secretary of ICT and now he's an associate professor and a management consultant. We also have um, Mr. Mugbo Kibati, who's the Chief Executive Officer of Telcom Kenya. We have Mr. Adam Lane, who's the Deputy CEO of Government Affairs of Huawei. We have Christian Moen, who is the Head of Geneva UN Charter Center of Excellence on SDG City Transition. And we have Madam Susan Bogo, who's the Public Sector Director of East Africa, that is for the Intel Corporation. Thank you all for joining us and thank you for being part of this conversation. And as we begin, I'd just like to point out that uh, we are well aware that uh, Buonandemo as well as 
uh, Bona Kibati have to leave uh, leave for other engagements um, in about 24 minutes or so. So I will uh, kindly allow you, I mean, I ask you to bear with us. We'll begin by, you know, taking on their, que uh, their questions I'd like to have for them. Then from there, we can at least have mined the beautiful goal from them as we continue this discussion. So I just want to um, begin by asking you, uh, Dr. Nemo, first and foremost, um, I remember myself covering you years ago when you were the PS, and uh, the Konza Technopolis was one of your, you know, one of the big things for you. Uh, maybe you could just begin by telling us um, from where we are in terms of the progress that you've seen. What is your comment, and what do you feel needs to be done to ensure that um, not only Konza but the, the, the general technology space of Kenya is, uh, is broadened and strengthened? Thank you, Dan. First, I want to say thank you, uh, PS, for inviting me to join you. Thank you, John, and uh, all my panel, uh, colleague panelists. I must say that the government has done a tremendous job in terms of actualizing concert technology uh, park. You realize we conceptualized it even before the SDGs in 2015. Yes, before we actualized this in 2015, uh, I mean, before we got to the SDGs in 2015. Um, the work that has gone on, on is very, very commendable in the sense that even the data center is ready to be used at the moment, um, meaning that young people who are getting into spaces like um, development of gaming, and which is growing so fast, and government, which is, which is going through digitalization, uh, we can have space. You realize when we did all Kenya Open Data, we had to take much of the data outside of the country. That would not be happening in the sense that we have a local data. Uh, Perhaps um, the, the, because there is so much to be done. Sorry, I'd request everyone just mute the microphone um, that you'll be able to hear Dr. Tari and the rest of the presenters. Thank you. Okay. What I can add to that, uh, um, it is going to attract a lot of investments, uh, but where we must be very careful is the, 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 the zone we created, which was 10 kilometers outside of Konsa, that the development there be very um, almost equal to Kansas City itself. That actually was put in the law, and there was a small portion of the rail which was to link the SDR so that we can have back and forth, uh, back and forth uh, going to Kansas and back to Nairobi, um, which which the Ministry of uh, the Transport Ministry acknowledged, and I think it's in their books. Uh, but I hope that also happens. I work with so many young people throughout the country, even today, and uh, what they are looking forward to um, from the infrastructure that we have done, we can actually do more by creating um, campsites where they can go a whole week to do um, hackathons, um, because of the emerging technologies which we are discussing today, like uh, Internet of Things, um, streamlining of supply chains, which is growing. Indeed, I've just come from Gikomba with a team of the presidential advisor to look out on how to streamline the SMEs. SME is a huge resource for this country, which waits to be digitalized and the given applications which would support it. We have seen what has happened after COVID that even the SMEs themselves would need to find themselves in the space of e-commerce, which is going on if we don't want to disrupt that sector, which I know even the government has invested a lot of resource in SMEs, Consa would provide the solutions for it because this is the area that I see 
a lot of young people are doing applications in the agricultural sector. Um, there is a chance for, for us to not just leapfrog, but bring in a service sector that would propel the country from where it is to another level. And I'm very confident the team that is in the ministry will deliver this to us. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ali, for those open remarks. Very insightful, as always. And um, it's good to see that we are including more of what we may call the analog um, SMEs to join the whole technology movement. And uh, just to begin off with uh, Mr. Kibati, um, Mr. Kibati, you know, there's, there's a, a pandemic at hand. And with it has come a lot of, like the peers have said, it has become a promoter of technology. There's heavy demand for internet. So what is being done to ensure that there is reliable, stable, and affordable access? Because without that, it is an opportunity that is, you know, it's, it's only, it's like window shopping. It's only good to see, but hard to access. Thank you, Dan. Um, I hope I am audible. Um, yes, well. Indulge me a little bit. So first of all, let me say thank you very much uh, uh, for this invitation to participate today. Uh, the PS for a very incisive keynote speech, which I think covered all the various aspects of why Konza exists. And I also want to thank uh, John, John Tanui, the CEO, and all my fellow co panelists. If you'll indulge me a little bit, Dan, while I'm, I've been invited here in my capacity as Telcom Kenya, and I'll come to that, I must say how happy I am because remember, this was a central flagship of Vision 2030. And um, being jo joining my my erstwhile partner in crime at the time, Professor Ndemo, um, because we spent a lot of time uh, on this project. Uh, when he talks about the railway connection, uh, the meter gauge railway connection to the SGR, the 10 kilometer perimeter around it, we had some robust discussions about it. At one time we even contemplated and maybe uh, Bonatanu and Bona PS, um, even building an airport, uh, <laughs> uh, a new international airport at, uh, uh, in Konza to make it a truly, truly uh, global Silicon Savannah hub. Silicon Savannah is one of the terms that uh, Professor Ndemo um, uh, uh, came up with. So I'm happy to be able to reconnect um, on this project. And also, just back to the question, to Dan's question, the pandemic question lends itself to this project in very many respects. The more obvious ones are, of course, what you're asking about technology, and I'll speak to that. But I think one of the underlying themes about this pandemic is how developed are we as a nation and as a country? Um, Vision 2030, remember, is geared towards establishing us as a middle-income uh, economy in which everyone has a chance at a prosperous life. And Konza really uh, is was, was, was envisaged to help harness the innovation capacities of the country, to be the spearhead of the innovation capacities of the country. And to the extent that we are able both to be technologically advanced and two, to lift our GDP, then future pandemics of the nature that we have been faced with this year will have less of an impact, less of a negative impact. But Sorry, can you hear me? Lost... Sorry, can you hear me now? Yeah, you lost you. Yeah, let me, let me, yeah. So I, I was saying that um, uh, I'd like to commend the team at uh, Konza and, uh, and the ministry for having now given us confidence. There was a time there when we were wondering what's going on, but the PS explained it. Uh, having seen the confidence of actual real progress, tangible, credible progress. So let me also say thank you very much. Uh, for the work that you have done. And I actually, I understand what you're talking about, when a PS, when you say that the foundation takes a long time. Um, even the thinking work, the planning work, all the the the, 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 the studies that have to be taken and the planning. Sometimes, you know, they say 80% planning, 20% execution. Uh, so I, we, we know that we'll see very fast progress from here going forward. So to your question, um, yes, the pandemic has actually, in my view, brought to the fore the importance of technology because we have now been you know launched into an era where 
lower touch, lower contact will be demanded of us in all our social, professional, corporate interactions. And in the place of what used to be manual and physical will come in technology. We as a telco have been thinking about this very deeply, uh, not just us as a telco, but technology companies across the world have been thinking about this very deeply and trying to reimagine the future. And in fact, our recent uh, reorganization at Telcom Kenya has been geared towards positioning Telcom to prepare for this reimagined new norm, new future, this lower touch, lower contact society. And while, of course, we pray and hope and uh, believe that the deleterious impacts of this COVID pandemic will end soon, and we shall obviously go over the hump to the other side, there are certain changes in habit, certain changes in uh, norms that will stay and will sustain themselves beyond COVID. So really um, what has happened is that already existing technological trends have been accelerated. There's nothing really new that has happened. You know, this particular forum we're having on, um, on, on Microsoft Teams uh, video call and I'm sitting in my house as opposed to you know being pre with you in a, in a conference hall is a symptom of the future and some of these norms will remain but it's a fact that Microsoft Teams, Zoom, Web, you know, WebEx all existed before COVID came in. Many of us had these technologies uh, in our various technological suits but we never used them but what has happened is that there's been a tremendous acceleration of, the, of these trends making uh, or presenting huge demands on um, technology providers such as tel telcos. Connectivity has become ever more important. We now have tremendous demand on bandwidth, uh, on mobile connectivity. We have seen a tremendous significant shift from, uh, you know, towards residential homes. Residential homes now require a lot more bandwidth than we had anticipated just a few months ago because now people are telecommuting they're tele-educating their children. They, you know, we at Telcom have come up with a telemedicine um, application that allows people to be able to consult doctors, even summon ambulances from the confines of their homes. Um, uh, so, so, you know, tele-entertainment uh, now, uh, uh, ordering food while you're sitting at home. All these are certain habits and norms that, have a, that make a tremendous demand on bandwidth, on data, and on connectivity. And so we are all being forced to react to that. Telcom Kenya actually is, uh, has organized itself to be able to provide that. But over and above connectivity, um, it is very clear that going forward, again, another trend that already existed but has been accelerated, um, you all, all of us, will depend a lot on technological platforms to do what we used to do physically. And therefore, we as the Telco have, uh, have, have made a, 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 a deliberate a deliberate decision that we have to go beyond being a connecting telco and become a technology company, a company that is able to provide the connectivity that you're all accustomed to us providing, but also providing solutions that are up the value chains, especially in providing platforms for social and professional interaction. So really, uh, Dan, my answer to your question is that um, um, for us, from where we stand, we see that the essential service that is today a telco provider has only been made that much more essential. Uh, the challenge on us, the onus on us, is to be able to ensure that we provide convenience uh, to social and corporate interactions now that people have been forced to connect technologically. It's an exciting time for us, uh, while we obviously pray that... Um, the challenges of COVID um, will, live, uh, will, 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 will disappear soon enough. And let me conclude just by saying that uh, as Telcom Kenya, we're very proud and happy to be closely working with uh, Konza and looking forward to be able to do more with Konza. As you build out this, what was once upon a time a dream, but is now clearly becoming a reality. So thank you very much. And once again, congratulations to the team at Konza and the ministry. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, um, Bonakibati, for that. And, you know, just like you mentioned, just to point out to those who may not be in the know, he was the Director General of the Vision 2030 uh, Secretariat, which is part, which is our blueprint of development as a country. Now, I'd just like to come back briefly to uh, Dr. Ndemo. And Dr. Ndemo, you are 
also, you know, the chairman of the Distributed Ledgers and Artificial Intelligence Task Force. And when we think about pursuing smart cities in Kenya, which again is something that, you know, uh, like Konza, for instance, is going to be a significant player in, what, 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 what do you think needs to be looked at as we pursue, you know, smart cities in Kenya? And also when it comes to AI, people are concerned about their safety. There's too much of the information that is out there. What's, what's the balance? Thank you again for asking this question. You had, you had from the, the PSC's speech. Sorry for a bit, just a bit. Doctor. I'd like to request everyone to mute um, your microphones and switch or turn off your videos. Uh, to avoid any interruptions, so we can have a seamless conversation. Um, kindly do so. Thank you. Yes. yes, as you had from the, there is Macau who is on. I think, yes. Apologies, can I jump in kindly? Uh, JM Yano, please uh, mute off. Your, your video kindly. Let's have Gulamu as well, kindly. Thank you. And Dr. G.K. Macau, I think, also. All right, okay. thank you. Yes, I think you heard from the, mini, from the permanent secretary and also from the CEO talking about the IoT lab. Um, this is because we are all getting into the fourth industrial revolution. There is no choice. I mean, like we choose that we can't get into these new technologies simply because we have seen what happened when we missed the first, the second, and almost missed the third industrial revolution. The, the issue you are raising about uh, privacy and artificial intelligence, uh, the reason why we are doing smart cities is because we want to ensure security for every citizen. What you have seen recently, even in Nairobi, a lot of the crime that goes to court, uh, it has become almost official standard that was there, any CCTV oh, capture. And we have seen so many of those, even media actually rely on them, on the, on, uh, on the capture from the cameras. Most smart cities across the world, this is what you are seeing. We can't say, oh, we can't do this. Because we don't list the benefits we get uh, from smartenizing the city. Look at, look at for example, the cameras in, the, in Nairobi. You have never heard of robbery with violence of the vehicles as it used to be. Because even the thieves know that whichever direction you run, the, poli the police will know which direction you are going. So in terms of security, we are improving because of the deployment of technology. The amount of work that is going to come out of that is enormous. And that is what we need to evangelize instead of looking at the negative side. Look at, uh, take for example, insurance. Insurance is issuing um, digital certificates because the, the infrastructure is ready. The infrastructure that would enable them to track which vehicles have insurance and which ones don't uh, is ready. It, that aspect alone has removed a lot of theft that used to be there in insurance. Uh, look at what the government has done with Huduma Number. Huduma Number would facilitate development. Oh, 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 oh. And, Okay. Sorry, Winnie Michuki, would you kindly turn off your microphone? Winnie Michuki. Thank you, Paul, Prof. Carry on. Yes. Uh, the, what we are awaiting, those who are in this new, sec, new tech, is that once we do my number is there to validate, it is possible now to provide the credit, which is not secured. I mean, it, it is because of AI that you have loans being issued without collateral. When people write about inclusivity, people don't write the details that government of Kenya had invested heavily in things like uh, 
Huduma number invested in infrastructure you see in the cities. So we want to be in that space to create the new jobs. People are talking about the future of work. If we make a mistake now and not invest in that space, we will lose in terms of the future of work. If maybe next time we would have a session to talk about the kind of future works that would come to replace the current ones. But they don't, it doesn't eliminate these jobs. It doesn't intrude in your life, but it gives you a lot of security as you do this. I mean, I can go on and on. Look at what's, what has happened in Kibera, for example. Digitalization of Kibera has created enormous amount of businesses, improved security within Kibera itself. They are now talking about modern world where things can be delivered on their doorstep where we didn't have addresses. So we are actually going forward by the deployment of these emerging technologies. All right, thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, but um, just, just to point out, the poll will still be worried about no cause AI. I can mention Bitang and Demo. Then when I go on my Facebook, I see you as a friend, a, a suggested friend. You know, and so people are wondering, you know, with this access to information that is even an involuntarily given or offered, um, how do I make sure I'm safe? We need to train people. Uh, we need to train people, and that's why and I think the PS is going to talk about it, about the digital learning program, that people have to learn that this technology is a, a Maasai sword, which can cut both ways. If you misbehave online, you can mess up your life. If you behave with your data online, it would benefit you. So we, we need to use DLP, to teach people, and I think a lot of work is done. I don't know how much because the PS is here. Um, actually, it's Kenya and maybe two other African countries which have realized that the digital literacy is a must because you cannot live in this world without getting into the space of digital. I mean, even us at the airport, uh, they are, soon they are going to stop ticketing because it is one of the most expensive spaces that you have. You have to check yourself in. Um, a, a few years back, we were being stranded in foreign airports because we never self-ticketed ourselves. It has come to our place, and soon it's going to be replaced. So the, the future is here. We must find ways of learning and coping with it. Thank you very much, Dr. Harry. And um, just uh, thank you for joining us. And at this point, I know you would be free to leave, but you're free to also stay on with us. And before we release uh, Mr. Mugo Kibati, just wanted to get your one minute um, view, uh, Bona Kibati, on the, you know, the pursuit of smart cities in Kenya. And, you know, what, what in your view, is uh, the progress and what do we need to do to ensure that we have a successful pursuit of the smart cities? Um, thank you, Dan. Uh, one minute. I think Professor Ndemo has uh, covered it. I think uh, from a perspective um, as a telco is what I indicated earlier that we not only have to provide the connectivity, which obviously is the foundational thing that the telcos provide, but we have to be part of that smart journey uh, that, sit, that, that cities are going to go into smartness, so to speak, because as Bonandemo has indicated, um, security, convenience, reliability, predictability, even planning. Um, whether you're a big corporate or a small uh, micro um, uh, enterprise, the more, the smarter cities are, the higher the security, the higher the convenience, or rather the better the convenience, the, the higher the predictability, the predictability they bring. Planning becomes easier and therefore growth uh, becomes a sin qua non for, 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 for entities, whether they be micro enterprises or large corporates. And with that comes a huge GDP um, uh, enhancement. I think that what that will require from all of us, and I, I'm glad that Professor Ndemo indicated that, is that we all have to smarten up and digitize. All of us. All of us have to grapple. 
with the digitization challenge. Even digital, even technology companies have to do something about digitizing because we're all accustomed to running things rather manually. Um, artificial intelligence, uh, again, which has been very topical today, the more we apply, the more we apply data analytics. And I think by the as a society, we're going to have to become a lot more data oriented, um, a, a lot less lose, a lot less, you know, of thumb suckers, people who just guess and, and, and grope around things when we have so much data available. And yes, as Professor Ndemo has indicated, it cuts both ways. I mean, data can be misused, and I'm glad the PS is here. The ministry has worked very hard to ensure that the downsides of data through the Data Protection Act and such other uh, initiatives are taken care of so that we have the, the ability to exploit and leverage the positive elements. But I think one of the areas where we have a lot of work to do and which will enhance um, the, 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 the benefits of smart cities is us becoming more data oriented because we have a lot of data that we, we, we don't uh, we don't utilize. I remember uh, when he was PS, uh, Professor Nemo, we used to talk about a lot of uh, you know. He used to talk, remember Bon and Nemo, you talk you used to talk about how much tomato tomatoes we are um, tomato paste we are importing and yet we are destroying tomatoes in part of this country, right? Because the data is there, but we're not just connecting it. So, uh, Dan, my my simple response is: the smarter cities are the better utilization of data we have, the better an economy because of the security, convenience, predictability, and therefore ease of planning, and therefore the benefits accrue to everybody. And we as where telcos will have a significant role to play, telcos will have to move up the value chain to be able to also be part of that smart journey. Thank you. Thank you very much. And again, I want to thank, uh, to thank uh, uh, the CEO, Konza, uh, and also the PS for this wonderful forum. Sorry, I, have, we, I, I can't stay much longer. But I think it's a fantastic, fantastic forum. Man, can I add one small thing? Yes, yes, kindly. But thank you very much, Bona Kibati. Yeah. One, I think the ministry is doing so well in terms of leading the way because every other ministry is looking at what we, what the ministry is doing. Uh, that when the government adopted what we call the, the new curriculum, um, the competence-based curriculum, the bus left it down because a lot of CBC is going to rely on artificial intelligence. That's the only way you can have kids who are slower to catch up. Uh, and, and soon they will begin to ask ICT ministry, how do we uh, create the content that would make these kids catch up? The bus left town. Uh, if when we talk about big data, what Mugo said and it triggered my my mind. This morning, as I went through Gikomba, I was asking those women, uh, which are the dresses that move faster. And then I explained, you have size 12, size 14, size 16, size 18, and they said 12, 14 and 16 they go. So I was asking them, so why do you have so many size 22s? One of them said, yeah, nyewe, hii na jukuanga miesisi takuza. Na hizi zingine sinaenda. You see, this is big data you are teaching somebody in the combat to know that if you, you want to be liquid, you need to have size 12, 14, and 16. You can't invest your resources in size in size 22, 20, which are rarely bought. And in fact, they confirmed that they, it gets to a point where they reduce the size in order to be able to sell. So we, it is for us, the people who have understood the role of big data, to evangelize that and to put these people into the future where we are headed. And as such, I want to thank the PS and to thank the CEO for inviting me to speak to you. Thank you. Dan, Dan, yeah. Dan if I could throw in uh, a comment uh, yes. with respect to your question before we leave that is, uh, yes, uh, Prof, Prof have talked about, I know your concern is uh, about people's data, mm -hmm. but then like he said, is, 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 uh, is a sword, double edged. But then we are saying from the side of 
development, we really wish and to encourage more people to really uh, uh, take advantage of big data. In terms of uh, privacy and uh, taking care of data, then as a ministry and as government, we have the responsibility to do things. One of them, uh, Prof has talked about, which is basically uh, training and aware awareness creation. Secondly, is on the element of legislation, that we have uh, policies, policy and uh, legislations that take care of people's data. That if I give out my data in good faith, then again, it should not be misused. It's for that reason that we have the Privacy and Data Protection Act or the law that actually now begins to protect people uh, as uh, so that you feel comfortable that as you give out your data, then the data will be used specifically for the purpose it has been uh, requested for. Again, we also talk about the Computer Misuse and Cyber Security Act. Again, also just trying to, so our role is to then say, we are in this space, we need this particular data for uh, development, but then again also we have rules and regulations that manage the use and the, the, the management of people's data. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Buona PS, for even just chiming into that because, you know, it, it really sits on your table, on your desk. And before I just go to the next, um, to Susan Bogo, briefly, Buona PS, the question here many would have is then how do I access that information? Because everybody across the board agrees that there's a lot of data out there. Uh, Buona Nemo has given a very good example of how, you know, he broke it down to the, to the uh, person who sells clothes at Gikomba. So where can I access this information? I'm a journalist. If I wanted to know ABCD, where can I get that information so I can make informed decisions? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, let me say again also that uh, currently, yes, we have data and uh, information uh, cut across with the respective agencies. We've not reached to the point of uh, uh, consolidating all this data. But then right now, like today, you have the powers to actually go and make inquiry from a specific government agency that we require this kind of information and actually they have the obligation to uh, give you that particular data. I know we had started and like for example a very good example when His Excellency the President said that we needed to put public data on public procurement so with collaboration of uh, the ministry in collaboration with the public procurement uh, put up uh, a site whereby uh, people are able now to actually go and see. Right now, you can go and query any one particular date. I mean, any information about a particular contract. You even get who was uh, awarded, how much it costed, and things like that. So we are in the journey to transparency. And I know, like I said, this is this is a journey, and uh, it's something that we have, we have begun. But now, with the uh, underlying uh, legal and regulatory framework then it even becomes more easier. So that again also, you don't also walk into a hospital and say, give me Jerome's uh, medical record, because I have the powers. I mean, I mean, I have the authority to see, uh, I mean, I'm requesting for that data as a citizen. Then the law also says there is what we are calling personal data, whose uh, access and uh, um, uh, exposure must meet certain thresholds and must meet certain requirements. So basically, those are some of the things that we are working towards. Um, thank you very much, uh, Buana uh, PS, for that some good insight on that. And I just want to bring in uh, Susan Bogo, who's a public sector director of Intel Corporation, that's the East African br branch of it. And uh, Susan, thank you for joining us. Um, Internet of Things, you know, has been touted as you know a largest revolution in data economy. Maybe you could bring us up to speed with regard to how COVID-19 has brought this into reality and what role, you know, Intel is playing in this space. Thank you. Um, thanks, Dan. Um, I'll start by thanking the PS and the staff at the Ministry of ICT and the Konza City Management team for setting up this webinar. Um, I also appreciate my fellow panelists and all the guests who joined us today. 
Um, so Dan, before I answer your question specifically on IoT, I'll just uh, take a minute to give some context about how um, the company's overall strategy has is linked to IoT solutions. So a couple of years ago, we evolved our strategy to turn the company from having um, an engineering focus to being a data-centric company. Um, the world is becoming increasingly connected and in order to provide real value, we realized we'd have to expand our scope beyond the hardware. And so the new strategy now is to design and develop technology that moves data from what we call from the edge to the cloud. And we have solutions for IoT at the edge, the network, the data center with the traditional hardware, but also AI and analytics, which we've talked about. Um, on IoT specifically, so we've partnered with the wider technology ecosystem to develop solutions for practically every sphere of life. And I think relevant to Konza are our smart city solutions for things like building management, you know, in a situation like Konza, like uh, COVID, you have building management where you have contactless entry, you know, we have traffic managed systems, security and surveillance systems, smart health, uh, smart education, um, the CEO talked about the importance of smart waste disposal and waste management, uh, and of course, smart government services delivery. So I, I believe there is a massive opportunity for Conza to leverage all of these technologies and uh, to create what will become the, the most innovative city in, in Africa. Um, thank you very much, uh, Susan, for that. Um, that insight and i want to bring in um <clears throat> adam lane who's the deputy ceo of government affairs at huawei kenya and you know we, we've spoken about we've been speaking about konza on and off as we talk about um the technology situation and future of the country um but maybe you could just take us through the overall structure of the smart konza data center just to help us understand um how this is going to be working Yes, thank you, Dan. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, yes, yes, I can. Yes, I can. Great. Okay. Um, I'm not sure. Can you see my screen as well? Yes, you can see it. Imaging digital technologies in Konza Smart City. Okay, great. Just checking. Okay, wonderful. Yes, I won't talk very much, and I really appreciate the time to be here. Thank you very much, uh, PS. Uh, I think um, we're really glad to be here. I think uh, both Mr. Mugo and Mr. Demo have left. We appreciate the time that they've also spent. Um, I think most people on the, the video call will know about Huawei um, and that we are working very closely with the Ministry of ICT in many projects, um, not only in the infrastructure projects, but also I think a lot in the skills projects. And I know uh, Professor Ndemo mentioned the importance of skills, the training programs um, and so on. Uh, so let me first give the big picture of Konza as uh, the CEO uh, Tanui uh, mentioned earlier in the introduction. Um, you know, the Konza itself is a smart city and the national data center is a part of that smart city. Uh, the data center itself then has a couple of different roles, one of which, of course, is a government data center itself. Um, the other role is in terms of providing um, the management and the data for the smart city itself as well. So there's the two different parts. I think as um, the CEO Tanui mentioned, there's two data center is phase one, which is already completed, up and running, already hosting some government data and information uh, managed by uh, Konza and the Ministry and ICT Authority. And then phase two is the primary data center, which is a, a large building, which is, I think you saw the photos, quite well advanced and should be finished by the end of the year. Uh, and then, of course, there's the kitting out of that second data center in terms of the, installing the equipment and then the other smart city equipment as well. And uh, so this is kind of a, the brief overview. Um, the way that we look at smart cities, and of course others may look slightly differently, is that you obviously have the base uh, with network itself. So you have the communications network and you have an IoT network. You have a data center uh, and then you have platforms. So you have an IoT platform, you have a big data platform, and you have what we call an operation management platform that manages the city. Then you have the different applications that run on all those platforms cloud and network. So it could be government, it could be around transport, it could be around parking, a community, and so on. So this is just the, the brief overview and how it all fits together. And the great thing about Konza, is part of this horizontal infrastructure, they'll have the network, they'll have the cloud, they'll have the platform. 
and I'll have some of the applications that uh, will go through. Of course, others can just bring and add their own applications onto that together with Konza themselves, which is a huge uh, benefit uh, for bringing and enhancing new things in the future with a very open platform. You need lots of open APIs, very interoperable, and that's, I think, really exciting for the future. The way that we look at the smart city is as a nervous system. So you have the brain and then you have the nerves. Um, so the brain itself is the intelligent operation center and the data center. And then the nerves are really the internet of things, um, as our friends from Intel mentioned, which are very, very important nowadays. And we see in Kenya already, you know, with them copper, um, with their pay as you go. So the panels is one of the biggest uh, IoT use cases at the moment in Kenya, very successful, very simple, but very successful. I think that's the key to internet of things. Um, I'll briefly mention the intelligent operation center as well. Um, this is very important. This is, a, as you can see from the, the concept down below, uh, what it will look like in terms of the desks and the large screens where you can analyze and look at all the information in real time and how the city is operating from the traffic um, as well as other aspects. There will also be an experience area where guests can come uh, and experience and see how things are working. Uh, and there'll be this IoT lab that um, you have mentioned as well, where people can, uh, together with Konza, develop their own solutions and tap into the data center and tap into the infrastructure that Konza has built to develop new solutions. And this IOC is really, really important. Uh, these are some of the screenshots from some other IOCs that we have around the world, and you can see the level of detail you can get. It's all based on the GIS, the Geographic Information System, where you'll have the, the physical map of the city. Um, you'll be able to overlay the, the security cameras um, and the traffic systems. You'll be able to overlay the environmental information. Um, we'll show you in a minute from the smart poles. And you'll be able to manage all of the data center as well. Uh, how much energy is being used in that data center. You'll be able to manage the security aspects as well. So it's And it's a very open system in the sense that you can plug in lots of different information to it um, and manage and compare different things. It's really exciting, actually. Um, I think the, the CEO had a, a, another picture, but the similar picture earlier of this smart poll. And this will be very exciting in Kenya. You know, these will, I think, be ready next year. Um, there's already some that exist in other parts of the world. And there's a huge opportunity here. Um, you know, some of these functions. So the first one, you can see this emergency call button, like a speakerphone. If you need help, you just press a button and it will go to the 24-7 manned um, security center but also will be utilizing the video surveillance cameras there as well. You have these environmental sensors looking at temperature, humidity, atmospheric pressure, wind speed, noise, and even PM 2.5, which is the uh, very small particles, which can be very dangerous for your health. Um, and having those there and knowing how bad the traffic is, is very important in a smart city. Very important, and somebody asked a question I saw in the chat earlier about the environmental aspect as well, is having smart lighting. So these are have LED bulbs that are very energy efficient, but also a lighting policy that's based on time and then sensors as well. So when there's no things moving, no people or no traffic nearby, actually the lighting dims. And then when somebody nearby moves, a vehicle or a person, then actually the lighting itself can increase. So it saves a lot of power and that's very important as well. It will have this Wi-Fi network. Um, that can also even provide small mini base stations as well to enhance uh, mobile coverage, and also have these digital signs, which can be used for advertising or public safety information or other things as well. So it's a really, really interesting platform that connects into the smart city data center using the fiber network and so on. So it's very exciting. And just utilizing and combining everything in one, it's also very cost effective. You know, not having to have one pole for the road signs and one pole for the CCTV and one pole for the lights and one pole for Wi-Fi. You put everything together. Uh, and that's a very smart use of infrastructure. Um, and then lastly, I think uh, it was mentioned earlier about the IoT lab. I won't talk too much about it. This is just some pictures from some other IoT labs. But I do want to mention one other very important aspect of the project, which is last year, Huawei worked closely with the Konza, as well as Machakos University, and we already set up an IoT lab at Machakos University, um, partly funded and very much supported by the Chinese government, which is wonderful. Um, and the idea was, uh, let's pick a university and a center of higher learning close to Konza that can build the skills, build the talent for young people to then be able to use that and work at Konza as well. And that will obviously be part of the broader ecosystem as well as the um, the CAST 
the university that will be built as well. And so that lab is already there at Machakos University. It's much, much bigger than what you see in these photos. Um, it's like four or five rooms long. There's um, smart bicycle concepts in there, as well as smart parking, as well as lots of IoT test kits and things. And that's really exciting. So it is about the people and about the skills to make the most of the smart city. So let me just uh, finish the introduction there, and I hope that's helpful. Thank you. It definitely is helpful. Thank you very much for that. Uh, that's some good insight, and you can see some, um, you know, some very efficient kind of proposals and way forward, which is a which is a good thing, especially in light of trying to see how we can minimize on our resource utilization and just maximize on the value they bring, as opposed to having, for instance, I look at that pole, and I'm so impressed because. You don't need to have one pole for light, one pole for Wi-Fi ETC. And, you know, a lot of this is just about having a sustainable environment. And I want to bring in Christian, who is the head of Geneva UN Chapter Charter Center, I beg your pardon, of Excellence on SDG City Transition. And Christian, maybe you could tell us about, you know, uh, first of all, the Center of Excellence um, and its role in advancing sustainable urban development, which is something that we're really pursuing even as we look to go smart. Um, Christian, can you hear me? Is Christian here or in the event that Christian cannot hear me for now, we could just uh, get to the next question and then as we try and see whether we can reach him. And I'd just like to bring in Susan Bogo once again. And Susan, we are seeing, for example, what um, Adam has presented. We're seeing a lot of, you know, technology, but what What's the, what does the picture of the future city in regards to technology look like in your view? Um, thanks, Dan. So first of all, Adam, I, I'm looking at your slides and I'm, my, I'm just going like, wow. Um, I think those of us who live in Nairobi, the city is already bursting at the seams as it is. And if you think about the fact that, you know, looking at Sorry, I think we've lost Susan for, for a bit. Um, I'm sure we'll be getting back to her in not too long. Um, Susan, are you there? She's possibly Hello. maybe using her phone and someone has called. Um, you can see there's interruption of our internet, but nonetheless, like we said, the internet of things, you're going to try and figure out how to make it work. Susan, we're we are back now? Yes, I'm back. You can hear me? Yes, now we can, yes. Okay, yeah, sorry about that. Um, so yeah, I was saying, so, you know, you can imagine a city like Nairobi, the current population is about, what, 4.4 4. 4 million people. And yeah. the, all the focus say that, you know, urban populations will double in the next, you know, in the next 20 years or so. So I, I can't imagine living in Nairobi with 9 million people. Um, you know, we'll have to definitely be smart about how we manage our resources. The good thing with Konza, though, is that, you know, we're starting from, from with a clean slate. So there's a lot of opportunity to imagine and reimagine what is possible. Um, and so technology allows that, allows that to happen. Um, a, a key pillar, I think, in smart cities also is that is the sustainability element of it. Um, and this is that we have to make sure that whatever we're doing now doesn't compromise the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. And so, you know, various people today have talked about how technology lets us make optimal use of the resources that we have. Uh, we are not wasting um, the environmental resources, financial resources. We're making the best use of the knowledge that we have, of the data that we have. Um, so I think technology definitely plays a key role. Um, and then something else that I'm not sure we look at a lot of the times is that you know, it can also be used uh, to create a strategic advantage. We talk about strategic advantage in companies, but it can also be used for cities because, you know, personally, if I have a city somewhere around me that has excellent security, excellent healthcare, it's clean, the quality of life is fantastic, that's definitely a place I want to live in. And so a city that's leveraging technology is able to attract the type of people who will in turn um, contribute to making it an even better city. So 
it's a really good loop that between what technology can do to improve the city, the city attracts people, and then the people in turn make the city better. So um, I think using technology is definitely the start of how future cities should be planned uh, to manage resources efficiently and and just improve the environment, the environment around it, and the quality of life of its citizens. Thank you, Susan, for that. Um, we shall be getting back to you in a bit. And I want to bring in the CEO of Konza Technopolis, that is John Tanui, into the conversation. And I'm just actually picking from some of the questions on the chat, and we shall be having a, a session of question and answer, but there's some which I think we can just pull in right now. Um, well, Antonio, I'm just one, there's a question here which was raised by um, Eric Kiyoko, who says that, who asked that, does Konza City have a tech incubation center in place already? Maybe you could address that, just in light of being able to empower um, to, and to nurture the, the capacities and abilities of different people. Thank you, Dan. Um... Uh, we are working currently with a number of stakeholders to ensure the tech um, ecosystem uh, across at Consa Technopolis. If you saw the presentation by Adam Lay, uh, you notice that we have already set up a hub inside Machakos University and it's already equipped with the partnership of uh, the support from other uh, stakeholders. And uh, that is going to drive the aspect of the IoT, this is the Internet of Things. We have also been running uh, tech apps um, for the last uh, two years in partnership with our technology universities, uh, including also Majakos University, uh, Jomo Kenyatta University, Meru, and uh, a number of other universities and uh, at Konza Technopolis. And this is a program which uh, will continue. We've been also holding events to focus on the kids the young, those are from uh, nine years to, to 13 years. And currently there is a program, a bootcamp for the kids, which is currently at Konza. This time we are doing, of course, online. We have also ran it for the last two years. So yes, we already have a tech innovation hub uh, at Konza Technopolis, and we intend now to make it more vibrant. We are bringing a, a number of partners. Um, one of the panelists here is uh, Christian from Norway, where we are also partnering with uh, Norway to see how we can bring more synergy in the innovation ecosystem and smart city solutions. We are also going to use the IoT lab, which will also be inside Concert Technopolis and the IOC as some platforms for innovation um, ecosystem uh, building. So Dan, I can stop uh, at that. Yeah. Th thank you very much, engineer, for that and for just giving us that insight. But um, I think there is um, the concern some I just want to bring up is that um, Bonandemo spoke about how he went to Gikomba and how in Gikomba, uh, you know, he, he basically broke down what we call big data <laughs> to the lady who is selling clothes. How are we looking at, you know, simplifying our communication on the tech aspect of things so that everyone can feel involved? Because tech is, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a fairly, it can get complex, but it's also fairly simple if it is well explained. How are we intending to break down the communication so that it becomes, um, doesn't look like it's jargonistic, yet it affects pretty much everyone? Yeah, there are a number of things that needs to be addressed in the entire innovation ecosystem and even in respect with the available data, because data is available, but it could be available in silos that you must be able to address the organization that is uh, responsible for receiving and hosting that data. But we are looking at uh, enhancing the, the collaboration between the different government agencies to see that we have, uh, we improve on this and the uh, Consa National Data Center will be one that platform that we are looking at how to bring synergy on available information. We are also looking at how to see more enterprises that will even focus on this data so that if somebody wants to do a business, would engage someone who is able to access data and provide advisory on what kind of business to 
to, uh, how, how to uh, form his, his business based on actually solid uh, data. So at Consa Technopolis, we will work with the other government agencies and also private sector who would want to build this data to a commercial a commercial uh, proposals that they can be advisory uh, to SMEs or to other startups. So um, there is a lot of opportunity there. Uh, example given by Demo is actually at our um, um, uh, Juakali sector, uh, the markets as what he mentioned. So there's a lot of opportunities to put this data into something useful that a business person can actually acquire and use it to get a competitive advantage in their business. As government, we are putting now the infrastructure in place, Concert Technopolis being one of them, and the National Data Center as our platform to support this. Thank you very much, uh, Buona CEO. And um, Dan, should we get into you in a Dan, bit? Yes. I think just also to just throw in a comment in in response to to your question. Yes, uh, well, yes. I know your 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 question. Say, I mean, you said that uh, tech is uh, uh, is is complicated. Yes, it can be. Yes. And uh, actually, uh, I would respond by say let's look at uh, uh, two sets of uh, people in Kenya. The what we call the Generation X and the analog generation. For the generation X, the kind of uh, information, uh, I mean, we, we wouldn't say that tech is complicated to them because they are the kind of people you throw to, a, I mean, a, you, you leave your phone on the table, even my, I mean, our five year, uh, six year old, but uh, within a few minutes, they're able to operate that device. Then there is the group, of the analog, that 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 old generation. The reason why it is becoming complicated with them is that they never grew up with technology. So what are we doing as government? And actually, I just gave that brief to just bring you to the journey of what we're doing, is that we are creating more awareness and we are embedding ICTs in our curriculum so that our young people grow up with tech as part and parcel of their lifestyles so that the future generation of uh, the Kenyan citizen will not be scared by technology. And that's why we started with the digital learning program where we are saying, let us have people beginning to understand technology as early as class one, so that as they move along, they grow along with it. They are certainly uh, done, probably there's a generation that you can't do anything about it in terms of changing it, but again, also, we can just, I mean, through awareness creation, and that is one of our, our strategy in our digital economy strategy, that we really emphasize on digital skills, we're really emphasizing on digital. And I appreciate most of the uh, institutions of higher learning have actually picked ICTs and embedded it in every single course. Because, I mean, previously you would not have thought about ICT in agriculture. Right now, ICT is driving agriculture, marketplaces, uh, precision farming, technology in agriculture. ICT in health, ICT in uh, environmental conservation. So basically embedding the concept of ICT in every sphere within our learning system. Thank you very much, Bona Pierce, for that insight. And um, I, I just because you've talked about we've talked about a bit of training and the likes, and I just want to still hold on to you, PS, for a bit. You see, we are seeing a lot of jobs which are being lost or being declared redundant because of the infiltration of technology. You find a huge manufacturing company which was initially labor intensive had a lot of people who are doing the like we call them Kaziam Kono. But as they automate more and more, we see a lot more of these jobs being sw sw swept off. So you just need the operators of these machines, not people through the whole chain. Now, are we training enough I mean, people at a commensurate rate as the jobs that are being uh, rendered uh, irrelevant by technology? Well, uh, Dan, as people normally say that uh, technology uh, steals jobs, my argument has always been that with the coming up of technology, it's the jobs that move from one space to another space. 
I'll give a very quick example. With the coming in of the mobile phones and the mobile telephony, uh, and even with the coming in of M-Pesa and uh, the mobile money transfer, compare the number of uh, uh, bank tellers who lost their job with the number of, uh, uh, what are they called, these outlets where people uh, send in money, the, 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 the kiosks, uh, the, 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 the agents, the, 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 the mobile network operator agents. Now compare those numbers. You realize that actually there are almost 100 times more agents because of the mobile money transfer compared to the few uh, hundreds of uh, 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 bank tellers who lost their job because people are no longer moving to the job, I mean, to, 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 to the bank. Likewise, uh, when it comes to issues of electron, I mean, uh, paying of bills, but you find that there are more agents outside there that have... Act so basically what you're saying is that uh, technology has an opportunity of creating more jobs. It's only that now we also need to move to where the jobs are. I keep on telling people we have this program called Ajira Digital that actually jobs have moved from the physical workspace to, to the digital workspace. So now if you want jobs, then it is you to chase the, the job, that the job that I used to do down here has actually now gone digital and it's actually now being digitally performed. So basically uh, the challenge here is that we also need to encourage people to embrace the element of change that they also move as technology also changes. So we have an opportunity of creating more jobs as we create, as we begin to embrace more technologies. And we should not be really worried that we are losing jobs. Thank you very much. So I just hear the message of, you know, don't just sit and wait for, um, you know, new opportunities. Go out for them um, because they won't just find you there. Correct. Yes. And um, I want to bring back Susan for a bit. And Susan, as we, like we said, we're in a pandemic, and you'd, what you know, maybe you could speak to about the utilization of the Internet of Things solution in curbing this pandemic. What role does it play, and what can we adopt to ensure that you know we can fight off this unseen enemy? Um, sure. I think one of the most important roles of technology in man managing pandemics is um, is in its enhancement of the decision making process. Um, I read somewhere the other day that nowadays data is so critical, it, it should be added to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, you know, Professor Ndemo talked about, you know, big data and analytics for, you know, people selling clothes. I mean, the thing is, we have the data, it's, it's everywhere, we have it. But the challenge is that uh, people are not trained to understand how to use it and organizations aren't really using it the best way that they can. So um, I think in a pandemic specifically, data becomes even more critical. You are in a crisis situation where people's lives depend on the types of decisions that are made. And so the better quality decisions that are made in a, in a short time, um, then the more lives you save, the better use you make of the resources that you have and people, money, you know, equipment, medicine, all of that goes where it should, when it should. And so IoT, um, it, IoT connects things, it connects devices to other devices and it connects people to devices. And um, then the infrastructure around it then helps us to make use of the data that all of the IoT devices are, are, are is collecting. And so all of that data capture, the analysis in real time is what makes it possible to make decisions um, you, you can also do simulations about if this is what is happening here now, then what is likely to happen two weeks from now in X location and therefore what resources do we need to move to that particular location? Who needs to be trained? Um, how do we invest further in certain equipment? So I think for me in a pandemic where IoT really plays a role is in just improving the quality of decisions that are made to save lives. Brilliant. Thank you very much for that. And I just like to let um, everybody who's part of this webinar remember that um, we will we'll be taking a few questions from you uh, in a Q&A sort of way. So to make it a bit more organized, there is the raise hand function on uh, on the tab there. So if you raise your hand, then 
I will um, identify you. Then you can ask your question. But some of them have already been posted on the chat. And fortunately, some of them have been responded to by the relevant people. Um, we've got some some of the team from Konza as well as Adam as well from Huawei. He's also uh, been responding to that. And so that is some good, that's some good feedback there. And now one of the questions that I've seen here that, excuse me, I'd like to bring in, um, I see some of the questions have been answered in uh, by some of the panelists already, which is good, uh, such as the jobs being created and the likes. And um, there's a question here I had identified. Um, one that is that keeps coming up when a CEO is about and when a PS is about security of data, which is uh, a very significant um, concern to many people, is recurring here. And um, one, let me just pick another question I've seen here. Um, let me see. I think I lost it, but but either way, um, there's a question here by Anthony. Are there any synergies with research firms, and how can research firms be part of this innovation? That goes to the CEO, uh, to the CEO, I believe, and also there's one about how do the people in circles, uh, you know, become, you know, enjoy part of the pie. Uh, when it comes to you know the technology and the techno yeah. city, wanna see you? I was meeting today. Hmm. <laughs> Danny, please mute your mic. Danny, please mute your mic. Thank you, Dan. Um, I'll start uh, with comment commenting on the aspect of security for the data center. Um, as you are aware, a data center is indeed one of um, what critical infrastructure or uh, critical facilities that must be physically uh, secure. Uh, also, it has to be um, put in a way that is uh, redundancy in terms of services uh, so that it can offer services even uh, in terms of disaster. So it must have a disaster recovery uh, site. There is also the physical uh, security to access. Uh, it must be only through a specialized uh, um, authorize, authorization that you can access uh, a data center. Also, you have to comply with the established standards because data is really um, critical. Uh, there is the privacy issues. There is uh, also uh, data is now viewed as uh, wealth and uh, it's a key critical part of assets of every organization. So anyone to be allowed to comply with, um, to, to, to host or all data must be compliant to establish standards. At Concert Technopolis, our data center, we are ensuring we are compliant from as early as compliance to, to establishment of the facility itself. We've complied with Uptime Institute, um, uh, design or operation part, we will also comply. So this will guarantee the users of the safety of their data. Second is we have also to train our users and also train those who operate and do the necessary checks to ensure that these policies and guidelines to guarantee safety to the users. So this is a global problem, it's a global issue, and we must adopt best practices to ensure that we comply. The second question was about um, our collaboration with other agencies. Uh, I think there was a question, how are we working with the research fund? Uh, we've, uh, there are a number of agencies within the innovation ecosystem, including um, uh, the, uh, within the Ministry of um, Education. We have Research Fund, we have Kenyan National Innovation Agency, NACOSTI, and we are working very closely with these agencies to ensure that we establish a one um, approach and uh, build synergy in our operations to ensure we give value to our innovators, the researchers, and avail the platform that we are working on. The, the the last question, um, uh, I, I don't remember the last question, Dan. What was your last question? Someone who was asking about how tacos can also benefit uh, when it comes yes. to the... Yes. So as we build Concert Technopolis, we are attracting the multinationals and a number of high tech firms have expressed interest to work with us. Some are uh, providing solutions, others want to have the applications uh, run at Concert Technopolis and to serve the 
Kenyan market and the regional market. We are also working with um, the, the Kenyan national entities, companies, firms who want to set up um, facilities there, technology, businesses, uh, research uh, development, software development centers, uh, facilities like hotels, residential office, and recently also because we have the special economic zones um, licenses. Uh, as a developer and an operator, we are now attracting um, those who want to set up manufacturing, light manufacturing at Concert Technopolis. And these are opportunities all available to the SMEs and even cooperatives. And uh, we've received uh, visits from a number of businessmen, uh, groups uh, of, uh, from counties, and we are welcoming the cooperative societies who would like to know more about opportunities at Concert Technopolis to contact us. We'll be able to engage them. We would like them to play a role and to find, find an opportunity. So this is an opportunity for Kenyans and uh, from wherever they are to look at what really uh, fits the, their business and we will be there to support them. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Buona CEO. And I just want to bring in some questions that have come in from uh, from the chat room. Um, and one goes to the PS, it's actually directed the PS from Ron. And Ron asks, uh, are there plans to introduce tax incentives for investors into the smart city and ICT sector in order to boost expansion of the Silicon Savannah? Buona PS. Uh, again, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Done. Uh, when we talk about incentives, eh? uh, let me say, people, I mean, there has to be, first, you have to be very specific. What tax incentives are we talking about? And the taxman always has this argument. When I give this particular incentive, then what is in for me? Is there another way through which that tax can still come to me? In, 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 in another way or even double. The objective of providing us a tax incentive is normally to create an entry and then through that particular entry, uh, through that value chain or business process chain, the, 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 the tax is generated through other means. So, I mean, it, it depends on exactly uh, what uh, how is being requested. Then that is normally reviewed against, does it provide an opportunity for more jobs? Does it provide an opportunity for more uh, manufacturing or whatever it does? So basically, it's something that really has to be more specific for us to have uh, a discussion on it. Right, thank you. Um, so, just, but just in terms, I guess, maybe to be a, a what Ron would also just like to know is on the broader scale, are we looking at um, is there some sort of commitment that will actually have some incentives so that you know it could actually enable people to pump in uh, resources uh, into this uh, techno technopolis that is you know being seen as one of the biggest things of the future for us yeah sure 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 if if we have if we have uh, suggestions that we can actually look at and say this will really create uh, more opportunities then we'll be more than willing to really uh, take that and have a discussion with, with uh, the National Treasury. Basically, it's an issue of us putting up an argument and them appreciating. So it's not, we're not saying that it's completely blocked out. So, so Dan, maybe uh, I can uh, add to what the PS has mentioned. Uh, Concert Technopolis being licensed as a special economic zones um, developer and operator, gives us some incentives, and this is new because it's just recently that the government established the Special Economic Zones Authority and the act which was, uh, through the act which was put in place. So there are a number of incentives that are available through the Special Economic Zones, especially um, for those who are investing in manufacturing, there is an aspect of a recovery of your initial capital, special uh, tax rates, and, um, and and so many other uh, incentives. And recently also through the financing bill, you've seen some special taxes for certain products like manufacture of electronic um, system, tax, um, uh, gadgets, uh, devices. So these are already a number of incentives already provided for, but as PS mentioned, should there be any specific need, uh, the ministry through our PS is ready to 
engage and to see that whatever requested can be availed because we want to create jobs we want to create wealth within the country and this concert technopolis is one such platform to enable our country uh, empower people uh thank you very much uh, thank you very much for Yes, thank you very much, Bonasio, for that for that addition. And um, I also wanted to bring on a question by Joy, who asks, what is Kansas City's electronic waste management plan once all the technology in place reaches end of life? Maybe the CEO can take that one. Yes, um, electronic waste is actually a global concern, and Kansas uh, Technopolis as a smart city um, is... Um, complying with the latest guidelines in terms of smart cities, which includes management of all waste, the solid waste, the liquid waste, and also the electronic waste. Uh, currently, uh, uh, within the country, there are already some guidelines and there are already some entities licensed to dispose some um, electronic waste. We've engaged a number of them uh, currently in the country. And uh, we are also exploring what else needs to be done We've engaged uh, the sector, especially the bio, biotech sector, the electronic sector, to see all these waste that can generate as technology advances. How will we manage so that this is the, the, the management is in built, is in built to the, with, together with the city's development. So we are very uh, clear this is a very critical issue that needs to be factored from the design of the city and even during the operation and then to ensure that we have actually partners who are also certified in those fields to ensure they comply not only with the local uh, Kenyan uh, requirements, but also global standards so that we can achieve the highest standard in the smart city uh, index. So I think that um, is the commitment we can give. All right, thank you very much. And as we come to a um, um, so sorry about that. Just um, just a question. Sorry about that, um, but just a question that has been raised a number of times on the thread, on the chat, is about, um, again, 5G. And I'd like maybe Adam to just jump in briefly and just give us a clarification. There's concerns about 5G and, um, you know, and that Huawei is a Chinese company and that those who are feeling uh, there may be concerns around that. Maybe Adam, you could respond in just a bit. Uh, sure. First, I, I don't know why people are raising 5G because it's nothing to do with Konza itself. Um, Konza Smart City will be using Wi-Fi, 4G and many other technologies as part of the network to communicate data to the data center, which is fully owned, controlled, managed by, by the government. Um, so I just want to emphasize that uh, as it's been also responded by Lucas, who works at Konza in the chat group as well. Uh, 5G itself, people shouldn't be too too concerned about it. It's much safer. Uh, much better than other mobile networks. Hopefully, it will be coming to Kenya at some point in the future, but it's not related to to Konza in any way. Um, on us as a company, if people have concerns, please do feel free to get in touch with us. Look at our website. Um, you know, we've been working in Kenya closely with the government for over 20 years, uh, and we believe we have a very, very good track record, and um, most of the systems and networks are all very secure. And we're very delighted, actually, to have helped Kenya be so strong. You know, actually, Kenya... Uh, and all credit to the PS, uh, CEO John Tanui and others that Kenya is one of the best broadband networks in the continent. You know, I think 70, 80 percent of the country's got 3G network uh, and the smart city is very well advanced. You know, but next year there'll be a huge amount of things happening there. Um, and that's really going to help drive Kenya. We're really glad to be a part of that. And uh, Kenya's at the forefront of the digital economy, uh, bringing in Nigeria and other programs, too. And we're delighted to help. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Adam, for that and for just uh, giving us uh, that clarification, which is much needed because it's been one of the main questions there. There are a lot of, you know, concerns and questions which we may not be able to attend to right now uh, in the interest of time. Um, nonetheless, Dan, I believe... That, yes? Dan, there is one question I know I see. I'm also following the chat. I see yeah. it keeps on coming up and I think uh, 
probably I will just take uh, uh, one minute to, to respond okay. to it. It is yes. with respect to the issue of data and data security. I know uh, we had both spoke to it. Probably these are uh, uh, participants who joined in a bit later and people are concerned about data and data security. Uh, I just wish to emphasize the fact that uh, the reason why and uh, a few months ago we passed the Privacy and Data Protection uh, Act is because of the interest of data across the globe and also the interest of data within the country. Uh, I would just, because of time, I would request uh, uh, participants if they could spend a few minutes and just download the Kenya version of the Privacy and Data Protection Act that was passed. Uh, it's actually 2019 December. Uh, Privacy and Data Protection Act. It really gives uh, a number of uh, uh, strategies we've put in place and I mean the law really uh, governing how data can be accessed, how data can be shared, who is to collect, how to collect, what are the uh, thresholds of various uh, elements of data and even issues about sharing of data, data outside the country and uh, having our servers outside the country, all that has been handled by that. The reason why we came up with that is that really uh, there is growing interest in data and a lot of, uh, with our emerging technologies, our technologies will really be dependent on data. So basically then the more reason why we should actually have uh, laws governing and looking at how we access that particular data. And then also we also passed the uh, computer misuse and cyber security. Again, also taking into consideration as much as we are collecting data, then factors uh, considering how secure that data should be, again, are also taken care of in the act. So there are two pieces of legislation, the Privacy and Data Protection Bill Act and also the Computer Misuse and uh, Cyber Security Act. I think those are two pieces of legislation people may, uh, in this particular space, may want to interest to themselves with to actually see some of the efforts that are being made. And again, we are seeing that uh, since technology is dynamic, we are also observing the space. As uh, more and more changes come into play, then also we also come with the requisite legislative uh, 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 laws that actually will be governing data. So I think people should not be very much worried about data. We are uh, getting into the space of dependency on data, but again, we're also taking care of data as we uh, move to that space. Thank you very much, uh, Bona Pierce, for that, for giving us that clarification. And I believe that those of us who have been part of this webinar have seen where they, I mean, have heard of where they can go and you can go and get the information on those uh, legislations so you can then be more knowledgeable in regards to uh, what the law as it stands says in regards to this. And we are very grateful for you having taken your time um, to just be part of this webinar where we've been discussing about the technology of the future and the, play, the, the role that, you know, Conza Techno Policy is playing in regards to um, the technological future, especially at a time when we are battling a pandemic. And we've had a very good panel. Um, we've had um, we've, we've had Bitang and Demo who was there earlier on. Uh, we've had Mugo Kibati, that's the CEO of Telcom Kenya. He's also the former Director General of the Vision 2030 Secretariat. Uh, and Demo is a former Permanent Secretary in the time they were still called Permanent Secretary in, in the Ministry of ICT. And uh, we've also had um, Adam Lane, who's the Deputy CEO of Government Affairs at Huawei Kenya. And Susan Bogo, the public sector director, East Africa, that's the uh, Intel. And we've also had our principal secretary in the State Department of ICT and Innovation, that's Jerome Ocheng, who's also given us some of his uh, some of his views and some of what the government is doing and plans to do in regards to um, in regards to the whole discussion. So even as we close, we promise to be over at 4 p.m. It's 4 p.m. right now. Um, I just beg your indulgence for just a minute to let the CEO to just give a final comment, um, then he can release us. Bona CEO. Thank you, Dan. Uh, first, I want to appreciate our peers uh, who gave his keynote address and also the panelists who are here. 
we really appreciate sharing your ideas and we think this is not the end and also those who participated here concert technopolis is an opportunity for all of us and we are inviting you to bring your ideas here with us and we'll be able to even avail a platform for you to pilot any good idea that you have uh, secondly we are ready to also work with kenyan startups kenyan smes and also the multinationals who are looking for a, a, a location to collaborate with Kenya um, are setting up the research institute. It becomes a strong platform for all of us to collaborate. So I want to thank you and uh, also Pitangen uh, Demo and uh, and Mukoki uh, Kipati mentioned issues about initial planning about concern aspects of logistics and the buffer zone. And I want to respond that these are being taken care of. We are working with the, the three county governments and we are putting up a, a forum, a team that will be managing the development outside the concert technopolis within the 10 kilometer buffer zone. We are also working with the Kenyan uh, the agencies involved in the infrastructure to ensure that logistics be it the meter cage railway to concert technopolis, the SGR, and the other road networks to be done as it was envisioned. So we are on course and thank you. And finally, thank you, Dan, for moderating this uh, session. Thank you very much, Nia. Uh, and again, just maybe 30 seconds from the PS to just give us a, his closing remark as we come to a close. Uh, mine is really to sincerely thank all the participants and uh, thank you, CEO, and the entire team that organized this. Also, Dan, thank you very much for moderating. Uh, we want to keep this conversation uh, alive, and uh, we had agreed with Konza that. Uh, on a monthly basis, we'll be having a monthly webinar looking at uh, topical issues uh, in, in, in the Konza city. And every other time, we will be addressing a particular issue. So I uh, would just wish to uh, encourage the participants to walk along with us. And uh, this is our country. This is our city. Let us see how best we can make it so that we become a, a shining example in the region. We become uh, the example that people would want to, to refer to, and especially in this digital space, whereby we have re been recognized as uh, the digital economy uh, uh, front runners in this particular region. Thank you very much, and wishing you all the best, and looking forward to further conversation and engagement with you. Thanks, Dan. Thank you very much, uh, Buanao Cheng, and thank you very much to everybody who has been joining us, who has been with us from the beginning or midway up to this point, and even for those who have left and are, and are in absentia. Just remind you, if you want any more questions responded to, you could tweet Konza at, that is, uh, the Twitter handle is Konza Tech, at Konza Tech, that's K-O-N-Z-A-T-E-C-H, and you can also check out their website, which is uh, Konza... Yeah. And I'm glad to be your moderator this afternoon. Let the conversation keep going. I can see on Twitter where the top trend. So let the conversation keep going. And I believe that um, you will be able to get a lot more information and uh, value from this. Thank you and have yourselves a great evening and a great week ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much. Asante sana. Asante. Thank you.